Hi, I am a student trained in sciences and hard student of hard science and there's probably nothing harder in science than engineering. In engineering, there is a particular mindset that probably follows from Archimedes, who once famously said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place the lever and I can move the earth. So that is the arrogance of the engineer, that they think the application of science and technology will solve all problems of humanity, of the planet, of everything. This is something that, uh, since I've been trained in that, this is something that I believed for a very long time. Until in 1967, there was an earthquake at a place called Koena. And uh, in that earthquake, there's a dam at Koena which developed cracks. And suddenly there was a curious paradox that emerged. This dam is supposed to be the lifeline of the state of Maharashtra. It's the largest dam in the state. And uh, the reservoir that's behind the dam actually induced the earthquake. And if that earthquake had destroyed the dam, several cracks developed, then probably half of Maharashtra would have been destroyed. So this paradox that you create something as a lifeline and it actually becomes a threat is something that is rooted in a particular understanding of science. It's not just dams. I'll give you several examples to illustrate this, uh, this paradox, this circularity. Like for instance, floods in Bihar. When the water comes down from the mountains onto the plains, particularly during the monsoons, it spreads out onto a vast area called the flood plain. And that gets inundated and there's a demand that floods should be prevented. So engineers come up with the perfect idea. They say build two embankments, one on either side of the river, and that will prevent the water from spreading. Interesting idea. But curiously enough, the walls that are built on both sides of the river now prevent the water from the plains from coming back into the river. Consequently, what happens is that the, the, the land outside the embankments now begins to store water and it's permanently underwater. So people who are earlier farming are now fishing because these changes have taken place. There are several examples of this and this kind of circularity is best illustrated in 1969. There was the Concord, which came up, the first transonic plane to operate commercially. And Oxfam developed a poster, which is a very interesting poster. That poster said, here are the engineers who can teach us how to fly faster than sound, but where are the engineers who will teach people how to live on the ground? And that's provocative because it calls into question what is the task of engineers. And I decided at that time to go and discover what it is that people on the ground were experiencing. And time and again, this circularity of science kept coming back. In 1984, you might recall, the Bhopal accident took place. Most people forget that the Bhopal factory was supposed to be producing pesticides. Pesticides, why? Because that would increase the growth of crops and therefore there would be more food available for the people of India. But curiously enough, even at that time, there was enough food. 
and yet there was hunger. So the development of pesticides and fertilizers, which are a consequence of the what they call the fast growing or the high yielding varieties, essentially transforms biomass from the plant to the seed. So you're getting a higher produce of seed, but you're getting a lower produce of the plant itself. Consequently, there's less fodder available for cattle. And if there's less fodder available for cattle, you're not going to get dung. And if you're not going to get dung, you're not going to get fertilizer, which is why the urea industry comes in. But urea only restores some of the nutrients. It does not restore carbon back into the ground. So over time, the soil itself begins to lose its productivity. Let me take another example, which is of drugs that they developed antibiotics to kill bacteria, right? And that was supposed to lead to lower incidence of disease. But scientists forgot that bacteria also learn and bacteria learn much faster than human beings. So consequently, within two generations, three generations, the bacteria had understood how to develop resistance to the antibiotics. So again, disease emerged. And then you started developing, scientists like us, started developing more and more powerful antibiotics to kill more and more bacteria. And the bacteria kept developing more and more resistance. So this circularity of science is a product not just of science, but it is probably something as we discovered that it is something that emerged about 200 years ago which is that the imperial pretensions of emperors started percolating down to the masses, to the people, so to speak. What was this imperial pretension? It is probably best echoed in the Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger. Now this Olympic motto is symptomatic of the problems that plague science. Science is actually trying to achieve this all the time, to build things that are stronger, that are faster, that are higher, all the time. And the classic example, of course, is the automobile. In 1898, when the first automobile started becoming commercially available, the propaganda or the advertisement for the automobile was curiously enough, no odor, no vibration. Now this referred to the earlier era of the horse carriage. So the odor was coming from the backside of the horse, the dung that was scattered on the streets, and the vibration was coming from the horse carriage. So you remove the odor and you remove the vibration. But what you got in exchange was a vehicle that was consuming fossil fuels. And the internal combustion engine, which is the heart of the automobile, actually becomes one of the single most important reasons for the emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So something that was acclaimed as an environmental improvement on the horse carriage eventually results in the environmental destruction of the atmosphere itself. And this is the root of the climate crisis. What is the climate crisis? It's very simple. In the Earth's long history, it took it about, what, 60 million years to actually create fossil fuels, which is plants, bacteria, organisms, 
animals, they all died and the, the earth converted this dead matter into fossil fuels over a long period of time. It's called the Carboniferous era, 60 million years. Now this 60 million years of effort by the earth, we are consuming in 400 years. That's speed for you. It's a ratio of 150,000 to 1, which means essentially that the Olympic motto has persuaded us that we need to use up these resources faster and faster and faster. Why? Because we want to enjoy life slower and slower and slower. And this is the paradox that we keep moving faster and faster and faster. Why? Because we want to become slower and slower and slower. But we never find the time. And many of the people who are currently in that rat race, particularly after COVID, young people are beginning to realize the threat to their psychological health and they are taking leave, they are moving out or trying to move out of this rat race. So this climate crisis is a product of these two. One, the arrogance of science that it can conquer nature and two, this Olympic motto which is ingrained into us a competitive ethic of moving faster and faster and faster and faster. So what is the solution? If you look at something called carbon footprints, the sustainable capacity of the earth, according to scientists themselves, is currently two tons of carbon dioxide emissions per person all over the earth, two tons. That's the sustainable limit, which means that if you go over two tons, you are going to cross that, and wherever they found that magic boundary of 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. So you need to remain under two tons. Who remains under two tons? The average Indian, has a per capita emission of 1.7. The average Bangladeshi has an average emission of 0.6. The average American, that's development, climbs up to 13.7. That's about seven times the sustainable level of the earth. And you take the average multi-billionaire, they're at 56 tons and over. Why is the average emission in India so low? Because more than a billion people labor for a living within just four dollars a day. The American worker working with machines which use fossil fuels earns a minimum daily wage of $58 compared to India's minimum wage for unskilled labor of $2. Labor, therefore, is crucial to global sustainability. So who do we listen to on the climate crisis? Do we listen to the average Indian, the average Bangladeshi, or do we listen to the three richest persons on the planet who are today becoming the prophets of how to contain the climate crisis? And if you listen to their claims, what are they saying? They're talking about technology transfers. They're talking about carbon capture. They're talking about how to, in a sense, geotransform the earth so that it becomes cooler. All these are technological solutions to a problem that science itself has created. And that is why perhaps 
the profession of the scientist and the engineer is the most sustainable profession on earth. Why? For every problem they solve, they create another problem, which then they need to solve again. That's sustainability for you. It's got nothing to do with the sustainability of planet Earth. And if I come back to the average Indian, the average Bangladeshi, the average Sri Lankan, all the so-called underdeveloped nations in the world, what are they saying? What are the people on the ground saying? And essentially, they are repeating two lessons for us. The first lesson is learn to live within the sustainable limit of planet Earth. And the second lesson, that the only renewable form of energy is labor. Why? Because labor can only produce so much. And labor can only consume so much. And it is this relationship between consumption and production that will determine whether we escape from the results of this climate crisis or not. I hope this, these examples will serve to illustrate the importance of labor in making our lives more humane.